Happy Father's Day. It is, it is. Um, some people uh, like to say that this is the penance holiday uh, because dads are so often they forgot that uh, they had to come up with something to say thanks and they uh, felt bad about Mother's Day. And you know, Mother's Day still outspends us. You know, we're working on it though. I try to encourage my kids all the time to spend more money on my Father's Day. It hasn't quite worked yet. But, you know, there's more cards purchased, there's more flowers purchased. You almost got flowers. Did you get the flowers? Oh. This girl went to the mall and gave you something. Was it Marissa or Brian? Marissa. Marissa wanted to buy your daddy flowers because he likes flowers and things so pretty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just kind of like the headbands. Uh, uh, but we do pause and stop uh, to thank dads. So many times dads... Um, in today's society get a bad rap rightfully so sometimes because a lot of families today are setting with just a mom at home and dads haven't picked up their role and fulfilled the role so the first thing I'd like to say for you dads that have hung around thanks thanks um, you know I grew up with without a father figure in my life uh, as far as uh, my dad went. But fortunately, there were men in the church that stepped up and took that role um, and, and made sure that I had a godly influence in my life. And that's some of what we want to talk about today is the responsibility of a father to bring the godly influence back into the kingdom of God. Uh, so many times, the ladies have had to carry too much weight and the crazy thing is some churches look at ladies and say, well, you can't be in the pulpit. Well, we have to put them in the pulpit because there's no men standing up to do their job. So we've got to fall through and we've got, we've got to do something. So these churches have to back up a little bit. But I'm here to tell you that in the last days, men are going to have to stand up and fulfill their role. And not be so concerned with appearances. Not be so concerned with what it looks like in the world. The best testimony you can give, the best testimony you can give is I'm a man of God inside and outside. In the church, outside of the church. And better yet, at home. There's no better thing your child can see than dad praying. Than dad reading his Bible. And it's one of the things I told my kids. One of the areas that I blew it uh, and didn't quite live up fully to what I was, should do, was most of the time when I would do my Bible study and I would do my stuff of that nature, I didn't do it at home. I didn't model it in front of them. You know, before they were born, I used to take all my books, Frank, you know, all the Strongs and the Vines and all the, and you, when you study the Bible, it took up the entire dining room table. You know, and, and you would lay everything out and you would begin to study, you would begin to do these things. But when my kids came around, I took it out of the house. I would encourage you to model it in front of your kids. They need to see you pray. I'm going to talk to you this morning about a couple of dads in the Bible. Um, and I think through this study and the things I was looking at, there's one common thread that went through. Was all these dads failed at something. And you know it's okay. But all of these dads also had a strong relationship with God that they turned around and lived in front of their kids. The first man that we could talk about, the first dad we could talk about, would be Adam. The first human father that is listed for us in the scripture. A man created in the image of God by the hand of God himself. The life breathed into him. He had issues. He had issues of taking responsibility for his own actions. After they sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, God comes before her and he calls to Adam and says, Adam, what'd you do? He said, the woman made me do it. That's been a theme throughout history. Evil women. They make you do it. I just not. And Adam continued to do that. And then Adam had to struggle with the fact that because of his failure, he now had to toil and labor by the sweat of his brow. I always said the first time when I get to heaven, the first thing everybody wants to do is praise Jesus and pray. I want to find Adam and punch him in the mouth. No. Can I be honest? 
But he had to deal with that. And then he had to deal with the first murder. Cain kills Abel because Cain didn't want to do the things the way God intended for him to be done. I wonder where he learned that from. Think maybe he learned that from Daddy? Because see, they weren't living in the garden anymore because Dad fell short. But the one thing he did pass on to his boys and he did teach his boys was the forgiveness of God and the grace of God. Because it doesn't tell us in Scripture he left God, he ran away from God, he continued to seek after the face of God, he continued to demonstrate the things of God in a manner that his boys could understand. So the encouragement I can take for myself out of Adam's life is even though when I make mistakes, God's not going to forsake me. I may have to live with the uh, consequences of said mistake. That was a pretty heavy consequence, wasn't it? I mean, think about it for a minute. He lived in the Garden of Eden where he didn't need anything. He didn't have want for anything. Now, if he wanted an apple, he had to plant a tree. If he wanted to eat, he had to plant a garden. If he wanted meat, he had to kill something. You know, it, it, it was a, a, and that was a continual. And it's happened all now, all the way through history, because of his decision. It makes me wonder what things I've set into motion that are going to affect the generations to come until Jesus comes back. As a father, I get to speak those things into existence. I get to demonstrate those things. I have the privilege of, but I also have the responsibility of. Being a dad's a big responsibility. It's the best job on the face of the earth. So many times the fathers are looked at as disciplinarians. Now it doesn't always work that way, because my kids will tell you, if they wanted punished and they got a choice that was dad they wanted to get it from, not mom. You know, but, you know, dads have a tendency maybe to be a little soft, I don't know. But through this man, we see what happens with our actions and obedience and disobedience. What better thing can we teach our kids? We need to live our life in front of them. And don't be afraid to live your life in front of them. The second dad I want to look at was Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Most famous for what? The ark. But that was such a little portion of who he was. This was a man who raised his family and his children in a godly manner, even though everything else in the world was messed up. We think today's bad. You should have seen it then. So bad, and, and some people would say that if God hadn't made the promise not to destroy the earth by water again, he'd probably do it. But I'm here to tell you, he, it got God's attention so much, he was so angry with the way the world was going, he said, I'm just going to wipe them out. But there was a dad who, because of his faith, because of the way he lived his life, his entire family was spared. There's something to be said about a covering. We've talked about it. We've talked about it in, in the life of the church and in my life. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. John uh, Polis is my covering. He's my spiritual father. He provides in my life that, that, that covering and that protection. And in turn, when you're submitted to this house, I'm your covering. Now, then it goes to where you cover your spouse and your children. This is the way the principles of God work. And Noah sends us an example that shows us if we live godly, that the protection of God will be over our household. Even when the world is falling apart, even when everything seems to be going in, this, in disarray, even when everything seems to be just a mess and, 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 and the world's going to explode, if we will stay faithful to God, our households will be protected. That's a big responsibility, but also a big privilege. And then the second thing that he modeled was obedience even when it's ridiculous. Now think about it for a minute. It has not rained. 
They don't live by a great body of water. And here's Noah in his backyard building a boat. Kind of like Gibbs building a boat in the basement. It doesn't make any sense. How are you going to get this thing out of here? All the neighbors are laughing at him. Ridiculing him. You idiot, why are you building a boat? And by the way, what's a boat? And here he goes building this thing. And it's not little. I can just see the neighborhood committee now filing complaints. <laughs> Obeying God even when it's ridiculous. Because of his obedience, his entire family is saved. All these things go in. And not only his family, but the animals. Look at the effect that his decisions had on the face of the earth as it is today. Because there was a man that was willing to stand up and be a man. Take the ridicule and not compromise being a man of God. The problem that I see in today's society is we have dumbed down what it means to be a man. We got more men that want to uh, identify with being feminine than they do with being a man. I'm here to tell you to shake it off and be a man. What does that mean? You stand up and you take the rightful role that God's created you to have. God ordered Abraham or Adam to be a protector of Eve. Not because she was less than he was, but she was created different than he was. So it's a man's responsibility to provide protection. That's a privilege. If you can't do it, come on, we'll get some classes for you. It's your responsibility. But see, what's happened in society today is we mix up roles, and the women want to be all powerful and all this, and then men want to be all weak and everything. Well, that's not, well, I'm going to put part of the blame on the church. Because men have not been men. And it's time we do so. And we take that rightful role and we do the things we're supposed to. One of my favorite books was written by uh, Dr. Kirby Clement and his wife. It's a book called That He Gave Them, Not Him. The responsibility is to be a partnership. A man by himself is not complete. A woman by herself is not complete. But when God brings you together and you find the right person, you heard me all the songs of the world, that's incomplete, me know. It's true. It's true. When you go and you find the will of God in your life and the right woman comes into your life, it will complete you as a man. It will. <coughs> And it'll make you stronger. But then your responsibility is don't be an idiot. Hallelujah. Man, this is only making it to about here. George, you and I will talk the rest of them. It's home. Don't be an idiot. Be the man of God that you're supposed to be. Don't be afraid to look at your children and at your wife and tell them when you're wrong. Don't be afraid to go back and ask forgiveness. Don't be afraid to pray in front of them. Don't be afraid to read your word in front of them. Don't be afraid to hold communion in your own house. You realize you're the priest of your home. Well, I don't know how to do communion. Grab a couple of crackers and some grape juice and read the Bible. It's okay. You may not do it all formal the first time. You may not do it. It's okay. You're the priest of your home. But what a better place for your kids to learn how to behave in the presence of God than in your own home. And that will come as the father stands up and becomes the father. One of the things that breaks my heart more than anything is the death of the dining room table. In so many houses, and mine's guilty of it, we killed dinner. That used to be the place that you would get together. I can remember when the kids pushed for it, we used to uh, eat our dinner and shove everything back and play boggle. We'd make Ben, but... Uh, you know, boggle's a word game. We would sit there and we would play around with boggle and we would talk to each other and we would pray. And, and that was part of dinner. Let me encourage you, don't ever get too busy to sit down and have dinner. 
to spend some time together, especially you guys that, that have the little ones that are growing up quickly. And trust me, they're growing up quickly. The dinner table is the one place that you have that is less combative. It's not like when you walk into their space and you interrupt them when they're on their eye, whatever they do. You know? On the old hashtags, whatever. I, it's a pound sign to me. It's what it is. No such animal as a hashtag, it's a pound sign. And we go into their life and we interrupt them. But we expect them to put everything down and pay attention to us. But we haven't interrupted our lives for them. As a dad, you need to interrupt your life for your kids. You need to interrupt your life for your kids. Those of you who are new dads or becoming dads in the future, make sure you do it in the right order. I feel that back on Michael. We do marriage first. Zach, we do marriage first. Who else is saying? We do marriage first. Oh, <laughs> uh, you thought you could hide. Man. I got you. We, we need to learn the way that we did. Because you know who helped him build that ark? His kids. His sons came alongside of him and helped him build it. If I was going to do something completely insane, do my kids trust me enough to participate? Well, yeah, they do. They're here. <laughs> I'm one of the most blessed men on the face of the earth. Because every Sunday when I stand to minister, I have my kids. What more can I ask for? They were willing to jump on board with me when I was taking a huge risk. I, I had family members look at me, Frank, and say, don't start a church. We don't need another church. That's stupid. But see, my spiritual father told me at the time, it's time for you to start one. So I was obedient what he told me to do. And I went to my kids first and sat down and said, what do you think? That's another thing that we need to learn with our families and our children is don't be afraid to ask their opinion. You know, when we make decisions in the church, what do we do? We come to you guys and we say, this is what we're thinking about doing. What are your thoughts? If we could practice these things at home and include our kids in this decision-making process, but we just want to grab them by the hair of their head and drag them where we're going. You know, it might matter to them where you live. It may make a difference. It may make a difference on where you go to church. It may make a difference where you eat. Now, with my kids, it doesn't make a difference where we eat. That's the biggest battle we have. If we're going out to eat, where are you going to go? And that's the biggest fight. I can remember when April had to go four places, or at least three, because every kid wanted something different and they weren't afraid to say it. But see, as fathers, we need to be inclusive of our kids and make them part of the decision-making process and live the righteousness in front of them. The next example is Abraham, probably one of the most talked about fathers in all the scriptures because he's known as the father of our faith. It's Abraham. Abraham didn't become a father until late in life, uh, even when he shouldn't have been a father. But here's the thing. He lived righteous before God, so God gave him the desire of his heart. The word was prophesied over him when he was a young man that says, you're going to be the father of many nations. DJ, we know there's words that have been spoken over our lives that we don't see yet. God's not held up by our age. He's not held up by that. His word's true whether I'm 47 or 97. His word's still true. And Abraham held on to that. And one of the things we're going to talk about next week when we go back into our series on finances is we're going to talk about living under the blessings of Abraham. We all want the blessings of Abraham. You know, that's one of those things that everybody preaches about and talks about. But I'm here to tell you that to... to I'm going to be careful not to preach next week already because I want you to come on. The blessings of Abraham will only be upon you when you behave like Abraham behaved. In our lives as fathers... We need to behave the way he did as a father. 
He was so obedient, Frank, that he was willing to lay down his child to be obedient to God. He was willing to sacrifice everything. Now, I've been, there have been times I've been willing to kill my kids too, but it wasn't out of obedience of God. They, they pushed me to that rage point. But see, yeah, no, it wasn't Michael. Michael was perfect until he was three. Because of his willingness, what can happen in our personal lives and in the life of our church if we as fathers and as men stand up and become obedient <coughs> before God? Too many times we've been waiting on the mothers of the church to step up and do it. But it's time for the men of the church to step up and do it. To become the leaders that God wants us to be so that we can move in the blessings of Abraham, known as the father of the Jewish nation. But then there's one father that I really didn't think a whole lot about, and that was Moses. Moses had two sons, but more than that, he was the father of what, over a million and a half Jews that came out and followed him out of Egypt. But he was known as the father that was called the giver of law, the rules. And in the kingdom of God today, we're starting to see a move in the apostolic that is different. And that is people standing back up as spiritual fathers and not dictators. Spiritual fathers always want to see their kids do more than they did. Always want to see them blessed. Think about the example that Moses was to Joshua. Joshua, by seeing the example of Moses and the level of faith that Moses had, was able to go into the promised land and look and say, yeah, I see the giants, but we can take them. We can have what God says we can have. How do I know that? Because I was with Moses when God told him to go and to speak to the rock. I was with him when the Red Sea was parted. I was with him when manna came from heaven. I was with him when the birds flew over me. I was with him when our shoes didn't wear out. And I was part of seeing his obedience to God and what took place. And that took his spiritual sons, Joshua and Caleb, to where they could go into the promised land, even though Moses did not see the fulfillment of the promise because of his faithfulness to God and because of his impartation to his spiritual sons, they were able to achieve what he couldn't. That's what's happening in the church today. Spiritual fathers are raising up and beginning to impart into their spiritual sons and daughters so that they're able to achieve the things and see the kingdom of God advanced. Thank God there was a Joshua and Caleb. Otherwise, the Israelis would still be wandering around in the wilderness. But these two guys said, yeah, there's giants. And yeah, we look like a grasshopper. But we can take them. Man, you should see the grapes in that place. They said one bunch of grapes and took two guys to carry it on a pole. Now, I've had some grapes, but I've never seen anything like that before. It's flowing with milk and honey. In other words, it is a prosperous land. And I'm here to tell you that in the kingdom of God, it is a prosperous land. But there are some battles that we have to fight to get there. So we need spiritual fathers to impart to the sons and daughters so that we can cross over and do the stuff we're supposed to do. But that requires some lawgivers. We don't like this part. As a dad, I didn't like this part. I wanted to be the fun dad. I didn't want to always have to set the rules. I didn't always want to have to set the standards. I didn't always want to have to, well, grow up. You have to now. You have to now. You know, there's, there's one of those things, and, and this is what I think the difference is between a successful dad and one that's not so successful, is that when they hand you that child for the first time, a successful dad, something happens inside of you. You instantly grow up. If you don't, you're not going to be a very successful dad. You may not have any part of your kids' lives. But when that thing snaps in you, you start to grow up, and now all of a sudden, when you're making a decision, 
you realize that you're not just making a decision for you. You're not just making a decision for your wife. Now you've got a kid in the picture. And that should wake you up. That should help you make decisions differently on what or how I'm going to behave, on the things that I'm going to do, on the jobs that I'm going to take, on the education I'm going to have, on the things that I'm going to do, on the places that I'm going to go, on the relationships I'm going to have. Because some of those guys you used to bring home, you may not want to bring home anymore when you got a baby. So we need to make decisions as men of God to stand up. And just like I said on Mother's Day, you have to understand this is not always gender sensitive. We're parents in the kingdom of God. My favorite dad in the Bible was Joseph. Entrusted to raise Jesus. Jesus was not his. And the best model that I've seen of that is the way Larry Abraham John Taylor, John Spiker. These were guys in my life that stepped up and were my Jesus or my Joseph. Mm -hmm. I didn't belong to them, but they raised me anyway. They taught me to hunt. They taught me to fish. They taught me what a hard day's work was, and I used to tell Larry he only wanted me around because that's cheap labor. I went to the hay fields, and there we stayed. He taught me how to be truthful. He taught me how to love. He taught me how to care for others. That's what these men did. They were my Joseph. And let me encourage you in the church today. There are some even in our congregation, as small as it is, that don't have dads. Be a Joseph. When you're thinking about and you're planning trips and you're planning on things to do, call and adopt a kid. You know, Larry had kids of his own. He just included me in everything he did. John Spiker had kids of his own. John Taylor's came a little later on. But these guys grabbed a hold of me and they raised me and they supported me. So don't be afraid in the middle of it. I, my kids are grown and gone now. That doesn't mean I'm done. Yeah, I'm a grandpa now, but that still doesn't mean I'm done. Some of you guys, I'm fathering, but some of these little ones that need a dad figure, I still want to play that game. I still show up at t-ball games. They're not my kids. <clears throat> Don't be too busy to be a dad in somebody's life. You might say, well, I don't have any kids of my own. That's all right, we got plenty of them to go around. Plenty of them to go around. Because when John Taylor was pouring into my life, he didn't have any kids yet. He wasn't married yet. But he was always pouring into my life. He was always putting into my life. He was a Joseph to me. Joseph doesn't get a lot of credit. Well, neither did John. Either of the Johns. Neither did Larry. They, don't, they didn't get a lot of accolades, a lot of jump. That's not why you do it. But I would pray that if they would walk into the church today and see the man that I've become, they would realize the part they played in that. Think about the people that have influenced your life and walked into your life. So what I'm asking you today as a father is that you think about these dads that we've talked about, but also, trust me, I haven't touched quite a few of them that are in there. We didn't talk about David. The man after God's own heart. Made a lot of mistakes. Made a lot of mistakes. But he raised a son that was wise enough to ask for the wisdom of God and not for wealth and riches. That says something about his daddy. I'm asking you as a father that you step back and you evaluate your life today. Learn from your father 
what to do and what not to do. Don't come up with a statement, I'll never be like my dad. That's not what it's about. Because I can promise you there's something they did right. We may have to dig for it a little bit, but it's there. So I know I buried my father this year. And when they asked me to do the funeral, we had been estranged for quite some time. I hadn't talked to him up until just a few days before he passed away. And when they asked me to do the funeral, I had to do some real looking, Frank. What am I going to say? So I had to search through myself and realize to be the man I am required that Ed Sands be part of it. God required of him for me to be here. Even if you don't have that relationship with your dad, God needed him for you to be here. <clears throat> you have parts of the personalities, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Grab a hold of the good. My dad could sell an Eskimo an ice cube. He, he could. He was a charmer. He knew how to talk to people. He knew how to influence people. And I think a lot of my personality and the way I move was given to me through that. Because I have to influence people. God needed him to put into my life. So no matter what your relationship is with your father, remember God needed him. Find the good that's there and glean from it. Learn from the bad. Because every one of those fathers we looked at this morning, they did some things wrong. They did some things wrong. Abraham, we talk about his obedience, but we didn't talk about his disobedience. Problems in the Middle East today are because Abraham was disobedient. You realize that? We can fight for peace in the Middle East all we want to, but that's a God thing. Because of the disobedience of a man. We can look at David's life. There was a son that died because of his sin. He wasn't allowed to build a permanent temple for God because of the blood that was on his hands. He was a murderer. How easy would it have been for them to turn around and for Solomon to look and say, my dad was an idiot. I don't want nothing to do with him. He was a jerk. And, and then when it came time, then God says, what can I do for you? He looked at him and said, I want the money to build the temple. But no, he found the good that was in his father and he went after the heart of God. I pray that my own kids can look over my shortcomings and find that heart after God and latch a hold up. So today when you think about your own dad, don't think about the rascal he was. Think of the good things he imparted to you. As you look at yourself as a dad, evaluate how can I impart more of God to my kids. Maybe it's instituting a dinner time. Maybe it's reading the Bible before. Maybe it's just doing little devotionals. Uh, demonstrating God before them. We are the example of how the next generation will grow up. And I want to see a generation of men that are men and not afraid to stand up and be what God's called them to be. Amen? Father God, I submit it to you today. Lord, first of all, thank you for being our Father, for sacrificing everything and sending your Son here to redeem and give us the possibility to come back in your presence. Lord, I'm thankful that I'm your son. <clears throat> Lord, help me to be the spiritual father that you've asked me to be. Help me to be the earthly father that you've asked me to be. And Lord, help each one of us to begin to look at and discover those things which you've called us to do so we can step into the fullness of what you have for us, Father. Lord, that we could move truly in kingdom principles according to your word. Lord, I submit everything to you today that was said. 
and I lay it at your feet. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.